Welcome to another episode of the PFF College Football Show. I'm your host, Max Chadwick, alongside my co-host, Dalton Wasserman, and producer Eli back there in the studio. Dalton, we've been doing a lot of mock drafts as we anticipate the uh, 2024 NFL Draft happening in just a couple weeks. We cannot wait for that. This mock draft, though, is super special, man. It's something I've been looking forward to basically since we started this podcast. It is the all eligible mock draft so not only are the 2024 prospects who will will hear their names called in just a couple weeks not only are they included in this mock draft next year's prospects the 2025 prospects are also available to be picked in this mock draft and even 2026 prospects are available to be picked in this mock draft so basically what we're doing is adopting the nba's principles and saying hey you play one year of college ball you're eligible to be picked in the nfl draft so i can't wait to do this with you man i think it's a great way to kind of look ahead to next year's draft and the year after and say okay who are the guys to know in those drafts and how good are they compared to this year's class so man i love doing this last year when i wrote this article and uh it's my favorite thing to do now i think honestly man combining college football into the nfl draft even more than we do right now now. Yeah, honestly, and I think it was the hardest mock draft that we've done out of any of them. And I know there's so many scenarios for this year's, but man, oh man, there's a lot of talent coming in next year too at, at, at the Summit Prime spots. And I, I think the thing for me, there's a lot of talent at at the spots that are kind of weaker this year. So it kind of balances out the entire positional balance of it. But I, I mean, this when you add in this much talent, there was there's probably a dozen guys off the top of my head right now that we had to leave out of this. It yeah. just killed me, absolutely killed me. And then, you know, and then balancing just talent versus talent and team fits and everything like that. I, I actually think this is the hardest mock draft that we've done also. It's going to look so dumb in, in a couple of years when we get the 2026 draft out of the way. We're like, man, how do we miss that guy? How do we put this guy so high? Like, my, my eligible last year had some, had some misses that you're like, oh, that doesn't look great. But uh, it's still, I think it's a great way to kind of look ahead, though. It's, it's a fun way to look ahead to the 2025 and 2026 draft so just before we start some uh, some caveats to get out of the way Dalton handled the odd picks in this draft I handled the even picks and also no trades were allowed in this mock draft because obviously we have no idea uh, how teams would handle if everyone in college football was eligible to be picked in a mock draft um, so uh, of course the trades that already happened are still in this mock draft but no trades further from Dalton and I could happen uh, in this mock so Dalton why don't you kick us off with the number one overall pick which is the Chicago Bears with everyone eligible who are they going with it's it's still the obvious max it's still caleb williams heisman trophy two years of elite production and basically the writing on the wall that is here right now already with the draft just over two weeks away is what it would be in this i I just think you know the bears feel like they don't there's not a sure bet in this draft or in this all eligible draft than the bears taking caleb williams obviously we can debate the rest of this after and i think it just shows you you know we're about to see at the top of this draft how loaded this 2024 class is but the obvious is the obvious the bears are taking caleb williams whether everybody's eligible or it's just 2024 (laughs) or however you want to configure it that's what they're doing yeah i don't think i don't think it's much of a discussion either i think he's pretty clearly the number one pick and he actually in my all eligible mock last year he was the number one overall pick uh as well uh for the uh for the you know at, at the time Chicago Bears before they traded the pick uh, away so uh, yeah the, Bear, the Bears taking Caleb Williams I think is the right pick by the way again another caveat I forgot to throw in there this is what we would do as well because obviously we have no idea how NFL teams feel about 2026 prospects they don't even probably know about any of the 2025 or 2026 prospects yet they're all in on this year so this is what we don't and I would do as uh, as college football analysts for PFF so at number two uh, with that caveat said I'm going with Drake May the quarterback from North Carolina to uh, the Washington Commanders another 2024 prospect as of right now the betting odds say Jaden Daniels is the favorite to be the number two overall pick so if we're going off what we think will happen I would probably predict Jaden Daniels go here but if we're going off what I would do I would take Drake May two years of elite production in his only two years as a starting quarterback really elevated that supporting cast around him uh, whereas some other quarterbacks in this class had really good supporting cast Drake May really didn't have that I think his weaknesses have been really overblown yes he does have some head scratching misses on tape but he also has supreme arm talent really good athleticism and i think he's got a really high ceiling and and a much higher floor than he's getting credit for right now i've seen some quotes i think from merrill hodge one of them said you know he's the kind of guy that gets someone fired i think there's a better chance that drake may get someone fired by not taking him in the nfl draft than by actually selecting him in the nfl draft so i I think drake may is is kind of head scratching to me why he's being talked about as this major boomer bust prospect i think his floor is a lot better than people give him credit for so if i'm the commanders i'm still taking drake may even with everybody in college football eligible i still think he's pretty clearly the number two uh choice in the nfl draft 
Yeah, I'm with you, and, and I think I, I think the top three guys, I've told you, well, I'm about to get to the third one, but the top three guys in this draft and in this all-eligible draft, to me, are really, really tight, and it's just a matter of preference. But I'm going with my favorite one-third to the yeah. Patriots, and that's another guy from this year, Jaden Daniels from LSU, right off the Heisman Trophy season. best He was the best player in college football this year. Very much improved passer, absolutely lethal runner, doesn't turn the ball over at all. I believe only three interceptions this year and seven turnover-worthy plays. Just a dynamic, dynamic centerpiece that New England can add. Just They need athleticism, and starting with it at quarterback, I think would be a perfect fit for them. Um, you know, we, we could debate May versus Daniels versus even Caleb all day, but I think in any scenario, these should be the top three picks in some order, and I'm going to round that out with Jaden Daniels to New England. Yeah. Yeah, so I think Jane Daniels, he still would be the number three overall pick. I think this is like the exact top three I, uh, I'm expecting. Maybe not this order, but the, it's what I'm expecting on draft night. Probably even the top four, even too, because the Arizona Cardinals at number four. Marvin Harrison Jr., they're going with uh, with that fourth overall pick, another 2024 prospect. Once in a decade type of talent, man. I mean, you could tell, even if his name wasn't Marvin Harrison Jr., you could tell he has Hall of Fame bloodlines just by the way he plays, man. His technique is so, so advanced. Excellent route runner for his size, six foot four. I understand he didn't run a 40 yard dash, but he's really, really fast on tape he's routinely hit over 20 miles per hour on gps tracking um so good in contested situations got a lot better after the catch this past year now he's not supreme at it like he is at almost everything else but he got a lot better and that was really the one glaring hole in his game that we saw from his sophomore year and he you know really improved on that in his junior campaign um and this is also not only is he a once in a decade type of talent this is the biggest uh weakness on the cardinals roster right now they just lost marquise brown they traded away rondell moore they need a receiver so badly, and with Marvin Harrison Jr. on the board, I mean, this is as home run of a home run pick as you can get for the Arizona Cardinals. So they are still sticking with Marvin Harrison Jr. as the uh, their guy in this uh, all eligible mock draft. Yeah, and I think I think you ha- I think we're going to have a similar description for this team at five with the Chargers. Now, I think they've been linked the most to trade down scenarios in this year's draft, but since we're not doing this here, we're going to take the most talented player at a huge need. They got rid of Keenan Allen. They got rid of Mike Williams, so I'm taking Malik Neighbors out of LSU this year. Arguably the best receiver in college football. So explosive. There's even been debates lately about about who likes Harrison or Neighbors better in this draft among scouts, among analysts, among everybody. And I think the best way I could describe it is Harrison, I would say, is better before the catch and Mm -hmm. Neighbors is better after the catch. So part of it does come down to preference. If you like what a guy can do with the ball in his hands better, Neighbors might be your guy. But to me, he feels like a more explosive version of Stefan Diggs. I think you can move him all over the formation, in the slot, out wide. You could probably put him in the backfield if you wanted to. He can just do anything and score a touchdown on any play. And with as bad as the Chargers need receivers, I think they take the best one on the board in Neighbors. Yeah. Absolutely. So another receiver I have going here at six to the New York Giants, who also could use a lot of help in that receiver room. That is Roma Dunze, the receiver from Washington, uh, who is pretty clearly a top 10 prospect in this draft, in my opinion. And if it wasn't for Marvin Harrison Jr. or Malik Neighbors, he'd be the easy wide receiver one in this draft. And, and in a lot of other drafts, he'd be the easy wide receiver one, too. So he's not he's not a consolation prize at all. Excellent in contested situations. I believe he caught about 80% of his contested targets last year. And he even said at the combine, he's like, man, uh, those 50-50 jump balls they're like 100 to for zero for me and usually you hear that and you kind of roll your eyes a little bit for him it like it's like no that's that's kind of on par with what, what you we've seen on tape from him really good athlete as well um i i think this is a, a home run pick for the giants and honestly he might even fit that receiver room a little bit better than a guy like malik neighbors because you know they have a lot of the same similar type players uh to malik neighbors in that, in that locker room not to say that malik neighbors wouldn't easily be the number one receiver on that team but there's a lot of similar play styles there roman dunes it kind of gives a different element i think to that receiving core so i kind of like this fit a lot for the giants and i'm wondering if they uh if they're interested in doing that on draft night if they uh do end up pulling the trigger on uh on a guy like roma dunes on draft night or if malik neighbors who might be there if jj mccarthy trade happens who they would go with i think that's that's a really interesting conversation i feel like not a lot of people are talking about right so roma dunes to the new york giants with the uh six overall pick I, to be honest, Max, I, I also would not take Brock Bowers off the board there if I'm mm. the Giants. I, I still think that's a possibility. There's rumors about a possible retirement from Darren Waller. I think, I think maybe not for this all eligible because there's so much talent here, but I think, I think, in, in, I think, I don't think Brock Bowers is off the table for the Giants. But moving ahead to seven, I think maybe the next most obvious pick after Caleb Williams yeah. and Marvin Harrison, even all eligible. 
I'm taking Joe Alt to Tennessee. Yep. They need a left tackle. Put him next to Skaronsky on the left side, and you've got something really working. But I, I think even in this scenario, he might be the safest pick in the entire draft. Three years of elite production at Notre Dame, and you just look at look at every basically every analytical aspect of Joe Alt, and he's the best offensive lineman in this draft currently eligible all eligible however you want to put it I, I still think he is the safest pick and it just shows you how how loaded this 2024 class is that our first seven picks are all from this year's <laughs> class not that next year's class is any lesser but I mean just these guys are freaks and Joe Alt's on the freak list man I, I I do I still think he's the safest pick in this draft and for Tennessee to build it through the trenches right now after getting a whole bunch of skill guys around Will Levis in free agency it's just the right move Dude, the fact that he was three, like I said, three years of elite tape and also 99th percentile athlete they tested out at as, like, that is just like, yeah, I, I think it's a home run pick for the Titans. I think this is what they're going to do on draft night and what they should do uh, is take Joe Alt to really shore up that offensive line. So I swear to God, this is an all eligible mock draft. It sounds like just a regular 2024 NFL mock draft right now. This is all eligible. But like you said, man, these first seven prospects. I mean, it, they're just so special that, like, this is you got to appreciate the 2024 NFL draft, man. This is a damn, damn good draft that we have this year. And it's evidenced by how many guys are going uh, to start, even with everybody in college football eligible. But that stops right now with that eighth overall pick, which is the Atlanta Falcons, who everyone's talking about them taking an edge defender, maybe Dallas Turner. He's currently the kind of heavy favorite to go number eight overall. They're going with an edge defender. It's not Dallas Turner, and it's not anyone from the 2024 draft. It is James Pierce Jr., the Tennessee edge in 2025, who I think this is going to sound like a hot take. But with the 2025 quarterback class kind of being a question mark right now, there's not a guy. There's no Caleb Williams. There's no Drake May like we knew about going into this past season. There really isn't that kind of guy. Now, we'll really talk about some 2025 quarterback prospects in a little bit. But there's not really a guy. James Pierce Jr. could be the number one overall pick in 2025. I think there's a legit chance, man. This guy it was special as a pass rusher, as a true sophomore. 21.3% pressure rate, third among all edge defenders in the country. 92.4% uh, pass rushing grade, also third among all edges in the country. Fourth most valuable power five edge, according to our wins above average metric. Six foot five, 242 pounds, freakish, freakish explosiveness and speed to power. This guy is freak, really, really a freak athlete, man. He's produced at a really high level. Got to get stronger in the run game. Not a great run defender right now. And the other thing that when I was watching his tape and diving in more, he is winning exclusively off athleticism. Exclusively. Like, there are really not a lot of pass rushing moves in his toolbox yet, which is a negative, of course. You want to see more as he develops as a, in his, as a player. But also, could be seen as a positive, man. When this guy was like already a top three pass rusher in college football and basically just out-athleting SEC tackles, that should be terrifying if you say, hey, if this guy learns some moves, man, he could be damn near unblockable. So James Pierce Jr., I think he might be the guy to know in 2025, and I think the Atlanta Falcons would pull the trigger on him and who I think is the number one edge if everybody in college football was eligible. Yeah, he's an absolute freak of nature, and I, I might have even been more impressed by the pick six he had in the bowl yeah. game against Iowa. Just an absolute freak. Get to know him now because he's he's coming, and he might be the first pick next year. Honestly, had you not taken him right there, I probably would have taken him for Chicago at nine right now. So now I'm thinking about, do I want to still go with an edge player? Could I go in the trenches? Offensive line, there's corners, there's a lot of stuff. But I think I'm, I, I just like the – I would like the approach – for the Bears taking a receiver okay. regardless here. I, I really think one more. I think one more would do it. People are talking about the greatest supporting cast for a number one quarterback ever and all this. I think one more guy. They need one more. They Look, they've got Komet and Everett at tight end. they got all room at running back. You've got DJ Moore, who's really, really good. Keenan Allen, obviously, is really good still at his age. I'm going with somebody a little bit different. I don't think the guy that you expected me to go with. Give me Tetsuroa McMillan wow. from Arizona. From Arizona, look, we, we're going to be having this debate for the next year. Is we it are. Burton? Is it McMillan? Maybe somebody else arrives too, but I, I just, the more I watch him, and when you watched Arizona get hot after around week six last year, and they just got blazing hot through the end of the year where they were top five offense in college football, it was because McMillan emerged alongside Jacob Cowing in that offense. I watch him move, and he reminds me of Mike Evans. He's big. He gets across the field, but he's, he's not big and slow. Like He can really, really yeah. move. 
And you talk about just a guy who can body receivers, who can get down the field, who can win horizontally deep ins and crossers and all that stuff. I think that level of size and that level of movement skill at that size is the one thing the Bears are missing. If you have him on the outside and more on the outside and then Keenan Allen roaming the slot 100% of the time, I don't know how you cover it. I just, he's just, I just watch him and I see. Mike Evans, and that's hard for me to pass up. And I know that's wicked high praise. That's a future Hall of Famer. I believe is it now ten thousand yard seasons in yeah. a row, something crazy. Uh, you know, I'm not saying that produ- that level of production is like almost unprecedented. But I, I just the build and the way he moves, he's not normal for a big dude. I think he's around six four, might even be six five. Six five, yeah. He's he, he is at six five. He's he's not normal. He does not move like a normal 6'5 receiver. I would take him I would take him this high and part of it's the fit. I think if the Bears already had like a guy if they got Mike Williams instead of Keenan Allen, I may have gone with a slot receiver here, mm-hmm. but I think the fit for the Bears and just having a guy that size that Caleb could just throw a jump ball up to or that gets to the deep post or deep overs and things like that at his size I, I think it's just a better fit for the Bears. I think that's a great way to put it because I feel like a lot of people are saying, wait a minute, why is Luther Burden the third not the uh, top guy? I think the fit really matters with those those two, and Luther Burden is more of like a, right now, at least a, a more of a slot receiver uh, and a different kind of, a way different player than Tetra McMillan. And for people who think it's Burden and everyone else, dude, I, in my opinion, it's 1A, 1B. I, I think Burden and McMillan are that close to each other. And I think there's a huge gap between those two and everyone else in college football at the receiver position. Uh, McMillan's that special, man. He has, like I said, he's six foot five, uh, second most contested catches last year, only behind Roma Dunze uh, among FBS receivers. Also, had the lowest drop rate among Power Five receivers with at least 100 targets. He only dropped two percent of his passes, man. So he is a guy that you just throw it up to him. He's coming down with him, man. His catch radius is absolutely r- ridiculous, honestly. And uh, only Billy Neighbors and Roma Dunze had more receiving yards than uh, Tetero McMillan this past year. So. Big, big fan of him. I can't wait to see what he does with uh, Noah Fafita next year, who's one of the top quarterbacks in college football at Arizona. Uh, those two have actually been playing together since middle school. They played together in middle school, played together in high school, and now playing together at Arizona. Really cool story, and two of the best in the country at their positions. Uh, yeah, McMillan is another big, big name to know in the NFL draft. So I have the 10th overall pick. Uh, which is the New York Jets. I was tempted by Luther Burden III is one of them because I think they can use another pass catcher. I was tempted by uh, another guy in Brock Bowers who still hasn't been picked yet, who I think is the greatest tight end prospect maybe ever. I'm going to go with an offensive tackle, though. And I know they signed Tyron Smith and they traded for Morgan Moses, both older players, both guys I don't really think you can rely on to uh, to play a full season. So I'm going to go with my second best tackle on the board behind Joe Alt in this all eligible mock draft. Not a 2024 guy, even though it's a great class. It is Will Campbell, the LSU tackle, who was in the 2025 NFL draft. This guy was fantastic as a true freshman in 2022. 85.6 pass blocking grade on true pass sets, which is basically the best way to kind of isolate a player and look at how good of a pass blocker that they are more than pass blocking grade. If you isolate the true pass sets, that's a better idea of what they're doing when they're really kind of one-on-one with a defender. That grade was only behind Peter Skoronsky among Power 5 tackles. Skoronsky went on to be a top 15 pick that very next year. Will Campbell's a true freshman. This past year, he was fifth in run blocking grade. So he's an elite pass blocker, elite run blocker. Um, He has been a fantastic player for LSU in each of the last two years. Been their starting left tackle in each of the last two years. And yeah, LSU's offense loses some superstars and Jaden Daniels and Malik Neighbors and Brian Thomas Jr. They still have the best offensive tackle in the country, maybe even the best tackle duo in the country between Will Campbell and Emory Jones. He is a guy that you need to know in 2025, and he could be a top five pick in the 2025 NFL draft uh, along with another tackle in 2025 that we'll get to in just a little bit I think Will Campbell uh, is a really really special prospect and I think even in a loaded tackle class this year I think he'd be the second tackle off the board behind Joel Alt oh I'm with you I, I think I think next year you're looking at a guy who maybe if he has you know if there's a team at the very top with an offensive line you could even consider him for the number one pick yep. he's he's been that good for two years and and honestly Watching, you know, watching bits of his tape over the last two years, the only guy that I saw that he kind of struggled with was Jared Verse. Otherwise, his tape is as clean as it gets for a young left tackle. Man, his, his it's, power. It's, I think his power. I think his anchor needs some work. Uh, I do think that's a great point you make. I think Jared Verse's power kind of was a little bit too much for him. But other than that, man, if he works on that and work on his anchor and get a little bit stronger, I think he's got everything else to be a, a franchise left tackle, though. 
Absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, moving moving to number 11 here with Minnesota. Now, we don't have the trade-up scenarios to get one of the top three or four guys. But to be honest, probably with this many quarterbacks, if we're talking about eight, maybe even nine quarterbacks, you know, that could be a first-round pick or, the, you know, it's just a more loaded class when you have multiple years. I'm going to fix up their defense a little mm. bit in Minnesota. I'm going to take the corner Will Johnson out of Michigan. None of this year's corners. I'm, dip- I'm dipping into next year. We think Will Johnson – is the best corner, would be the best corner in this draft right now. 78.4 coverage grade, I believe it was, this year for Michigan, but it's a little lower if only because they're just he didn't get a lot of opportunity. He's like the lights-out press man guy that Brian Flores would be looking for, right? And, and I think he's the guy. I, I think next year he may get the Kool-Aid McKinstry treatment where everyone's just avoiding him. Like, you just yeah. can't throw at Will Johnson. It's not a thing. Like his his press man technique and as much as Michigan blitzes, it's it's so perfect and and honestly with Brian Flores in Minnesota leading the league in blitz rate and he got Makai Blackman another good one last year on the outside but to get a real alpha number 1 corner that he loves to have, Will Johnson in Minnesota would be an absolute steal. An absolute steal here as the number one corner and just a perfect fit for Minnesota. And I I could sit here and go, okay, I'm not – there's so many quarterbacks in this all-eligible scenario. Mm -hmm. I can wait. I I think there's – there's you know, we've got at least eight of them that we really, really like. And I could just wait on a fit at 23 and take the best player right now. And I think the best fit for them is – and that's Will Johnson from Michigan. Yeah, I agree with that. I think there's so many quarterbacks. There there isn't another guy like Will Johnson. I think there's another corner in 2025 that I think is close to him. But, man, Will Johnson has been so special. I mean, like Will Campbell in a lot of ways, he was elite as a true freshman. He uh, led the Power 5 in man coverage grade, a true freshman, with a 91-point grade there. 29.1 passer rating allowed this past season. That was fifth among all quarterbacks in the country. And then also, uh, to kind of give – and uh, a peek into how good he's been against elite competition. He had six targets against Marvin Harrison Jr. and Roma Dunze. On those six targets, he allowed three catches and had an interception on those six targets. Marvin Harrison Jr. beat him a couple times. I will not lie. But he had a, a pick against Marvin Harrison Jr. and he like locked down Roma Dunze in that national title game, man. So Will Johnson against elite competition too. He actually had a great rep against Quentin Johnson as a true freshman as well. He has been fantastic, man. So I agree with you. I think he's pretty clearly the number one corner in this all-eligible mock draft. Speaking of that quarterback class though, uh, the Denver Broncos are up here at number 12. They need a quarterback with Jarrett Stidham right now as their starter with Russell Wilson now at the Pittsburgh Steelers. I'm going to dip into 2025. I'm actually not going to go with J.J. McCarthy here or any of the other 2024 quarterbacks. I'm going to go with who I think is the best quarterback in college football right now, Carson Beck from Georgia, uh, who I think has a chance to be the number one overall pick. He's got to improve uh, in a lot of ways, but uh, he is a supremely, supremely accurate quarterback, precise timing. He had an 80.6% adjusted completion rate this past year, third among all quarterbacks in the country, 2.39 second average time to throw, which was the fifth fastest in the country. This guy gets the ball out quick on time, accurate to all levels of the field. Um, he's not he doesn't, He's not a great runner. He has not a lot on the ground at all. Average under pressure, man, but this guy, it's really rare for a program to lose a two-time national championship winning quarterback and improve under center. That's what Georgia did by going from Stetson Bennett to uh, Carson Beck, man. So Carson Beck was fantastic. Fourth most valuable quarterback in the country uh, behind Bo Nix, Michael Penix Jr., and Jaden Daniels, who were all three were Heisman finalists. Fourth best overall grade in the country. Fourth best passing grade in the country. Carson Beck right now is my pick to be the number one quarterback in uh, the 2025 NFL draft. Um, I, I, I could see him going number one overall, but I don't think he's kind of like a Caleb Williams type of prospect. You're like, that's guy, that guy's going number one. I could see it happening, but right now I think he's a guy that I, I'm willing to bet on right now as the uh, the top guy in 2025. Yeah, I'm with you. I think the only the only question with Beck is everyone's just going to say, well, he's not that mobile. Okay, that's fine. I think w- yeah. we've seen plenty of guys who aren't that mobile get by, right? The greatest quarterback of all time wasn't that mobile. So <laughs> I think Carson Beck is super accurate, I, I think, I, and he's perfect for that team, man. I, I wouldn't be shocked at all if he led Georgia oh, Peyton to the love this year. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm going to go to a guy whose mobility is not really in question. Now, this one, I, I've, I've been fighting over myself with this one because I, he's not my favorite guy, but I do think based on things we've heard, this is kind of a what I think would happen here mm-hmm. pick. And and I, for me, I'm, I'm going to go J.J. McCarthy out of Michigan from this year's class for the Raiders. 
Um, I just think, and especially with what we've heard Antonio Pierce say recently about J.J. McCarthy, how he thinks he doesn't see why he's not one of the top three guys in this year's draft. Um, I, I think that level of praise and just the way just everyone in league circles is kind of talking about McCarthy right now, it feels like he wouldn't go much further past this because you look at the next several teams and they really don't need quarterbacks. I think I think the Raiders would take the chance on McCarthy. They still need still need you know a little bit of help on their offensive line and in the backfield to build the running game. But you give McCarthy, look, you give him Devontae Adams and you give him Jacoby Myers and you give him mm-hmm. Michael Mayer. And it would be a place where I think he could stand a chance. Colton Miller at left tackle, too. They they have to figure out the right side of their offensive line, and they probably need to find a premier running back or something to go with Zamir White. But good defense, good weapons. It's a place where he could succeed. And I think with as much as they've talked about him lately and the league circles have been praising him lately, this is one more where I just think this would happen in this scenario is McCarthy to Vegas. Yeah, I like that as well. And I think you mentioned it with uh, – with him talking about, oh yeah, like Antonio Pierce talking about how much he likes him as class. I wonder if that's a little bit of him trying to push maybe one of the other top three quarterbacks down the list, maybe, and try to you know do that a little bit. But uh, I do like that fit though for Las Vegas to get Jason McCarthy, who desperately also need a quarterback. Uh, New Orleans Saints are up here at 14. Again, like I said before, great tackle class this year. I'm not taking away from it. It's one of the best tackle classes I can remember. But once again, I'm taking a tackle that's not in the 2024 NFL draft. I'm going to 2025 and taking Kelvin Banks Jr. from Texas, who I think along with Will Campbell I, we just sung Will Campbell's praises and deservedly so but these two guys man are going to be neck and neck I think for a lot of people as to be who OT1 in the 2025 NFL draft and again you know and it looks like at least right now it looks like a weaker quarterback class you could tell me both these guys are going top five and I'm like yeah sure I could see it Kelvin Banks Jr. man like Will Campbell started as a left tackle as a true freshman former five-star recruit coming out of high school instantly was excelling as a pass blocker uh, only a lot of pressure on three and a half percent of his true pass sets which was fifth among power five tackles that year again as a true freshman playing some elite competition played Alabama that year um, he has been a really good player for them as a sophomore uh, 86.8 pass blocking grade which was second among returning power five tackles um 2.3 percent uh pressure rate allowed which is also second among returning power five tackles sixth most off sixth most valuable offensive tackle in the country according to our wins above average uh metric the run blocking has been inconsistent but the highs are high man he has some really really high highs as a run blocker he had 12 big time blocks this past year which we count as our highest graded blocks basically the only tackle in the country who had more big time blocks than kelvin banks jr was talisa fuanga and we all know how dominant of a run blocker he is so yes kelvin banks jr the consistency as a run blocker is not all the way there as uh, as it is with talisa fuanga but he has some flashes of dominance as a run blocker, man. So elite pass blocker, still some work to do in the run game, but he has some a really high ceiling, I think, as a run blocker. I would not be shocked if he is actually the number one tackle in next year's draft over Will Campbell. And like I said, I think it's going to be a major, major debate between those two as to who actually will be the number one tackle next year. Well, it sounds a lot like Alton Fashano and even Fuaga this year, yeah. doesn't it? It's just going to be a matter of preference and nitpicking and all that stuff. But tell you what, no debate about who's the best at this next position here for the Colts. I'm going Brock Bowers yeah. out of Georgia. And and let's be real, if he wasn't a tight end, there really wouldn't be any debate. I, I think we have those first seven guys in this scenario off the board from 2024. Brock Bowers is in there. He's he's in that class, mm-hmm. right? As I, I think there's eight elite players in this draft. It's those seven, and it's Brock Bowers. The fact that he's a tight end is the only reason he's getting dragged down here. But I, I'll tell you what, he's about as good as it gets. And the more I've looked at this, and the more I think you talked me into this one through all our mocks and all different things about about the Colts. And and I I think about Brock Bowers and what he could do in Shane Steichen's offense and the way the way that he ran it in Philadelphia with all of the RPOs and just dumping a Dallas Goddard in the flat a million times over and letting him work after the catch. Bowers is way better after the catch than Goddard. He might not be as good a straight line blocker, but I'll tell you what, he helps your run game instead by creating space, right? Yeah. He gets guys out of the box. He gets safeties and linebackers leaning one way or the other, and he creates space like that. Nobody's better after the catch. And it Max, it really amazes me that because he's a tight end, he's kind of getting dragged down. Oh, where's he going to go? Could he fall all the way to 20 or something like that? Because you look at the last four teams standing yeah. 
in last year's postseason, and they had Travis Kelsey and Mark Andrews and Sam Laporta and George Kittle. Mm-hmm. What What is it about tight ends still that isn't being valued here? Because the good ones, the really good ones, are a matchup nightmare, and Brock Bowers fits in that category. I think he would put up stupid numbers. He Honestly, in Steichen's offense, he might lead the league in catches. Yeah. Seriously. Yeah. With, with I mean, you've just got like the true triple option threat, right? You've got Jonathan Taylor, you've got Anthony Richardson, and you've got Brock Bowers just hanging out 10 yards this way, and, and he could house anything after the catch. I mean, look, people are going to talk about, well, is he, is he really a blocker? Is he kind of under... I don't care. I don't <laughs> care. You look at everything after the catch, and you look at, obviously, the resume that he's put up in three years at Georgia... I, I don't think, actually, now that I've watched it a little more, I don't think there's a better fit for Brock Bowers than the Colts and Shane Steichen in that RPO offense. Dude, I agree. I, like I said, I think he's the greatest tight end college football has ever seen. He's probably the greatest tight end uh, NFL draft I've ever seen. And I agree with you, man. Tight ends are slept on in terms of their value. In fact, they're you look at our wins above average uh, or our wins above replacement for uh, for NFL, like tight ends – consistently one of the more valuable positions. I think it's really slept on as to how valuable it actually is for NFL teams. You mentioned with all those, you know, all the best teams in the NFL, they all have a really, really good or not even elite tight end. Uh, Brock Bowers, I think, will join that class of those elite tight ends, man. So I love that fit for him, and he actually might be there at number 15 overall because the Jets don't take him at 10. He could start tumbling a little bit, which I think is, is wrong because I think he, there's an argument to be made he might be the best player in this draft, period. I, I think it's a really uh, good debate you could have there at Brock Bowers. So I love that fit there at 15. I'm going with another 2024 guy here at 16 to Seattle who uh, I think could use an edge defender and I think the number one edge in this year's draft is on the board in Liatu Latu from UCLA who was fan fantastic this past season he had a 96.3 pff grade not only was that the highest among all players in the country it's the highest we've ever seen by a power five player since pff started charting college football back in 2014 the only guys the guys right below i should say blake quorum last year had a 96.2 grade and then three guys were tied for third with a 96.0 grade it was chase young and that Awesome year he had. One of the best seasons I've ever seen by uh, a defensive player at Ohio State. Was the number two overall pick right after that because of that season uh, in 2012. 19, I believe. Uh, well, yeah, 2019 was when yes. he had that season. Quinnen Williams, the right year before, another one of the most dominant years I've ever seen by a player. Uh, he was taken number three overall because of that year uh, after that. And then Kyle Pitts with a 96.0 grade in the 2020 season. Um, he also went top five because of it. So everyone else went top five, but Lyra to lots is not. So, and, and listen, there are some medical concerns and all that and some length concerns, but I still think this guy's, pr- for me, honestly, pretty clearly the number one edge in, in 2024. And I, I think the Seahawks would love to get him. Also, in a, in a 3-4 defense they run two, I think it's a, it's a great fit for him. I love him as a two-point stance edge rusher, and I think he'd be a great fit there for uh, Seattle there. So you can see he picks 9 through 16. We're halfway done with this all-eligible mock draft. And Dalton, the uh, the guys in 2025 are flying off the board right now. So what are you going to do here with the Jaguars here at 17? I got another one, and, and there's multiple needs in Jacksonville, but, uh, you know, it, and there were multiple guys that I thought about here that I, well, yeah, that would make sense, right? But I'm going to dip into next year, too, and, you know, and I think it's very, very close. This cornerback class, if you have both, yeah. I think this year's corner class is deep. Next year, you've got some talent, too, but I'm, I'm going to go to Notre Dame with Benjamin Morrison, a guy who should come out next year as a possible top 20 pick, maybe right around this same spot. Um, 84.6 coverage grade this year, three interceptions, eight pass breakups, and he's got an opportunity to come back to Notre Dame. It's very possible that Notre Dame has the best defense in the country next year, and Morrison is a huge, huge reason for it. They're great up the middle, but he's their best corner. Look, this year, you know, Cam Hart is a guy who's thought as like maybe a late day two, early day three pick. Morrison's even better than that. No question. And and if he's if he has another lights out year in Notre Dame with, you know, they obviously have, they have defensive tackles, they have linebackers, they have everything up the middle, but at that premier spot on possibly the best defense in the country, if he has another year or even better than he did last year, he's going to be a top 20 pick. He'll be right behind Will Johnson in this cornerback conversation. Ideal size is six foot, 185, just just lights out, man, honestly. And if he's if he holds up again on the outside for another year and Notre Dame makes the playoffs and there's a ton of notoriety and the best defense in college football, then he's going to go this high and maybe even higher than that. Next year's corner class is going to be – I don't yeah. know if it'll be as deep as this year's, but man, there's some freaks, and Morrison's one of them. I think there are like four guys, man, that are going to be like – I already am like stamping as first-round picks. 
I, do you think there's going to be, if Morrison has another elite year, which he's done for two years now, do you think there's going to be a conversation with him and Will Johnson, or do you think Will Johnson's pretty firmly CB1? Oh, no, I think it's possible because corner play, corner play is so volatile year to year. Now, right. with these two and these two programs, it's probably not going to be a whole lot of variance. I think the, I think what might, let's like I mentioned before, I think what might happen with Will Johnson is teams, especially in the Big Ten, are going to play Michigan and just go, we just can't throw over there. We can't yeah. do it. It's the same way how we walked into this year with McKinstry as the number one guy. And because he just didn't get thrown at at all, and they threw a Terry on Arnold instead, Arnold was allowed to shine. But McKinstry, you've mentioned it, you're on it. He may still be the best corner to come out of this draft. We could see the same treatment. If Will Johnson ends next year with like 20 to 25 targets the whole year, I wouldn't be that shocked. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't be shocked either, man. Yeah, Ben Morrison, 86.8 single coverage grade over the last two years. Best among all returning Power 5 corners. Uh, another thing, so we, I mentioned how Will Johnson against against the elite receivers. So Benjamin Morrison, Ohio State's played Notre Dame twice in, in the past two years. Uh, so he's obviously had some work against Marvin Harrison Jr. So he had seven targets against Marvin Harrison Jr. over those two years. Over his true freshman, true sophomore years, by the way, when Harrison was a sophomore and junior. So Harrison's older. He had two allowed catches on those seven targets and three forced incompletions. He... Marvin Harrison Jr. lost that battle against Benjamin Morrison. So I agree with you, man. I think Benjamin Morrison, uh, he and Will Johnson each might be top 10 picks next year in, in 2025. I would not be surprised by that all, at all because those two are special. And it shows that, you know, we've had two corners off the board so far in this all eligible mock draft. And in a really good cornerback class this year, none of them are 2024 guys. The top two corners for us are both. 2025 prospects, and I agree with you. I think Ben Morrison would be CB2 in an all-eligible mock draft. All right, Eli, Cincinnati Bengals here at 18. Eli, I got to do it, man. I, I can't believe he honestly fell at this point. I, if you have a mic, I would love to get your input. I'm taking Luther Bird in the third. Wide receiver out of Missouri, 2025. T. Higgins might be on his way out, honestly. Get another guy in there with Jamar Chase. Elite after the catch ability. I think he's like Debo Samuel-like in that aspect, and I think he's the best receiver in college football right now. I agree. I, I, I love the fit of McMillan to uh to Chicago but man Luther Burton the third in Cincinnati dude that is going to be a lot of fun so you I don't know if you have a mic right now man but this is uh I I, I, I love this fit yeah it would be awesome I, I think that would be incredible uh Luther Burton made me a lot of money before uh <laughs> before they banned uh college props in uh Ohio uh -huh. but uh yeah I really like Luther Burton great game I think he'd fit super well with Jamar um this is like a pipe dream type situation cuz realistically I mean he's probably a top 10 pit next year. So and since, if, he's, since he's picking 32 next year. So yeah, exactly. Kind of if all things go well, the Bengals won't <laughs> sniff the top 10. So so we'll have no shot at this guy, but in this type of situation, you'd, you'd love to see it. It'd be him or one of the the tackles that I would like. Yep. I mean, I'm still high on Fashanu, mm -hmm. um, but but Luther Burton will be a home run. Yeah, I feel, I just like I I kept like thinking about okay what what teams need a receiver and the Bengals didn't come to mind and then right when I was about to pick I was actually going to pick Fashano and then I thought about it, I was like oh my god Luther Burton's still here I gotta like I can't let him keep falling I gotta take him here so Luther Burton the third could be very easily could be wide receiver one next year could be a top five top ten pick next year but he still here for the Bengals here at 18 I think they would uh they would sprint this card in to get him with Jamar Chase there honestly totally agree i think they do need a slot receiver i'd be surprised if they didn't come out of this year's draft with a slot receiver after losing although tyler boyd is still unsigned he hasn't gone anywhere but mm -hmm. I'm, I'm figuring they might look to replace him in the slot but moving ahead to 19 with the rams and and i think this is uh, you know I, I loved your pick with latu in in seattle three picks earlier and, and i think this is another one where just scheme fit and need and everything just makes sense for it i'm gonna go back to this year and take dallas turner out of alabama uh, the Rams, obviously they lost Aaron Donald, but they do have Kobe Turner inside, who's, you know, a decent a decent heir apparent, you know, when you look at what he did his rookie year. The Rams have a real need on, on the edge. You know, they bulked up their secondary and free agency. And Turner, the same thing, one of the premier two-point stance rushers um, in college football. Elite, elite speed. Just a freakish, freakish athlete off the edge. Gives you a speed rusher, the closing speed to the quarterbacks. When Dallas Turner's rushing the passer, you have less time to operate. Mm -hmm. This is not a question. He he, honestly, if you took 15 pounds off him, he'd be a running back. That's how yeah. athletic he is. His releases off the it, it look they look like receiver releases when he's squaring up tackles and and using stutter moves and things like that. He he would just be the perfect two point edge rusher for the Rams in their defense. The way that now they could operate it a little different than Donald. They did like to use with Aaron Donald in there a lot of five man fronts to single him up. If they still do that and they have guys standing up on the edge, 
then I, I with Raheem Morris gone, obviously, I think Dallas Turner is is an ideal ideal fit as just a, a, an elite elite speed rusher that they need right now because their edge group I think it was a bottom five or maybe even bottom three edge group last season he would just add a dimension that of athleticism that they don't have right now yeah I love that pick I, I think it works really well in that defense especially uh they're the Rams at 19 so Pittsburgh Steelers my Steelers here at 20 um a number of ways I could have gone here I, there was a lot of guys on the board that I liked for the Steelers here but I'm actually going to go with Olu Fashanu, another guy in 2024. I think it just fits, man. I, I think keep uh, keep Roderick Jones at right tackle, put Olu at left tackle. They need it. Uh, they need a left tackle, anyways. Um, and he's not going to be here probably on draft night. But even if he is, I mean, this is a, a home run pick. But elite, elite pass blocker, um, special, special feet. He's never allowed a sack in his career. Uh, he's been starting for two years for Penn State, honestly. So um, I, I'm kind of surprised at how. Kind of like him and Drake May. It's like people are just like all of a sudden, for no reason, it seems like, just all of a sudden a lot lower on him because of the run blocking for Olu Fashano. But it's like for me, it's like, dude, we knew this about him. This isn't some like new revelation that we've had for uh, for Olu. Actually, Fashanu. Actually, uh, he put out there his name is pronounced Fashanu. So Olu Fashanu, um, he's he's... We knew this about run blocking. Like this is not a new revelation. We we talked about this for two years now. As this is the uh, the thing for him. And even with knowing that, I still said I would take him top ten, top fifteen. Even knowing that, because of how special of a pass blocker he is, which is more valuable. So um, I'm I'm really curious as to why people all of a sudden are using that negative. Um, and, and saying he should not be a top 15 or top 20 pick because of it, I don't get it at all, man. So I, I think with Sears here at 20, need an offensive tackle, need a left tackle. Uh, I think Olu Fashanu and Broderick Jones at right tackle, that is a damn good duo for the future for Pittsburgh, and they haven't had a great tackle duo in a long time. So uh, Olu Fashanu, I think, would be a slam dunk pick for the Steers here at 20. It's perfect. That's an A plus pick. It's it's literally everything everything they need. Obviously, they've got Wilson and they've got Fields now at quarterback. That uh, a premier left tackle. I don't I don't think any team in the in the NFL needs a premier left tackle more than the Steelers mm -hmm. need it. You know, so great pick there. This is another one where this is kind of a need pick at, with Miami at twenty one. They need things on the trench in the trenches on both sides of the ball, but I don't think there's any interior offensive lineman. That, that would go in the first round in a draft yeah. like this. So I'm going to go on the defensive side and look at – they just lost Christian Wilkins. The Raiders gave him a boatload of money to leave Miami. I don't blame him for taking it. But I'm thinking about now – I got into the debate, the, the, the debate, I should say, who's the best defensive tackle in this scenario. And it's it's hard. We got yeah. some freaks. We got a couple really good ones this year. But I'm going to dip into next year again. I'm going to go back to Michigan again. I think I, I could make a whole all-eligible first round of just <laughs> Michigan defensive players. It's, it's crazy. But I'm going to go with Mason Graham in the middle. And big number 55, 84-plus in pass rush and run defense last year, just took over come playoff time. I mean, his – Hip, he was the star of the show. He was really their best player against Alabama and then against Washington. Unblockable. Just completely unblockable. And to do it on that stage against those teams, against Alabama, the biggest offensive line in the country, and Washington, one of the best, especially in pass protection, just uh, just caused so many issues, whether it be for a Jalen Milrow, who's wicked mobile, or a Michael Penix, who's a pocket guy. He returns, I think, and I think you believe as well, as the best defensive tackle yeah. in college football. I, I mean, just the middle of Michigan's defense, even with some of the guys they're losing, Chris Jenkins and Junior Colson and Michael Barrett, the middle of Michigan's defense is going to be just fine because Mason Graham is in there, man. At just an absolute freak in both aspects of the game. Uh, I think a perfect replacement for Christian Wilkins in Miami. Dude, not only Mason Graham, Kenneth Grant is like a top 10 D tackle in the country too. I mean, they lose Chris Jenkins, who's a great player, going to be a top 50 pick, and they still have the by far the best D tackle duo in the country between Mason Graham and Kenneth Grant, who also, Kenneth Grant could also be a first round pick in next year's draft. I, I think that guy's really special too. But man, Mason Graham, only uh, one of two D tackles in the country with top 10 grades as a pass rusher and run defender. The other was Devondre Sweat from Texas. So uh, Mason Graham was unbelievable this year. Uh, you mentioned it. I mean, his motor, agility, uh, 320 pounds he's got great size too he I, I honestly like i was watching his tape and i was like oh he looks kind of undersized but not, not because he looked undersized because he was moving so ridiculously i was like oh this guy must be tiny and then i looked at him he's 6'3 318 i'm like oh my god dude like this guy is like yeah. a freak so i i think he's gonna be a top he could be a top 10 pick honestly next year i, I think he's a special special prospect um 
And maybe, dude, I, I know this is high praise. He could get close to the levels that we saw Jalen Carter and Quentin Williams get to as prospects. Like, close. I don't know about all the way there because they truly were special, but he is a, a unbelievable talent, man. And, and just, uh, you know, we'll get to another guy in 2025 and just a few picks so I think a challenge him for DT1 because uh, he's also special. But this pick I loved on here at 22 um, to the Eagles. They need a corner. They need receiver. So who am I going to go with here? I'm going to go with the guy that plays both. I'm going with Travis Hunter, Colorado, 2025. Uh, he's a guy that quite literally never comes off the field and fits two needs here for the Eagles. And I understand some people are saying, oh, he's got to play one at the NFL. And I might agree with that as well because you could see some times where he looked gassed out there, especially in that Stanford game, which I know he's coming off the injury, so I know that affected him. But uh, he did get torched by Alec Ayo Manor, who we'll talk about a lot next year as well. Um, but Travis Hunter, I, I still his ball skills are ridiculous. His athleticism is ridiculous. He's an he's a elite receiver, an elite corner. I his his versatility is something that we've rarely seen in football at all. Um, and I think he's one of the more exciting players in next year's draft. And I cannot wait for the discussions around him saying, "What is he? Is he a corner? Is he a receiver?" To me, he's both. Honestly, if, if it's not broke, don't fix it. Um, I think he's a guy that could play both. Now, I don't think he could be a starting player at both. Like, I think you might have to, you know, play him at one or the other. And I think ultimately his position long-term is probably corner. Uh, but I think you could still put him in there as a backup receiver on a number of reps and, and let him do that. So um, I don't know if he quite fixes both needs for the Eagles at corner and receiver, but the fact that he could play both at two positions of need. There are other corners I, I like more than him and maybe even some other receivers uh, I like more than him in an all-eligible mock draft, but the fact that he plays both and the fact that the Eagles need both, I, I couldn't pass it up here at 22. No, he's the best. He's the best pure athlete in college football, is what yeah. he is, and it's usually something you see in in the high school recruiting rankings, right? Where this guy just athlete. There's just an yeah. athlete tag, and we'll figure it out later. Travis Hunter is carrying that through college, <laughs> and, and you don't ever, you don't ever, ever see that. And to be honest, I I would probably lean right now on him being a corner, mm -hmm. but you know what? Colorado's so loaded, and and they've got they've got my next pick here too. Who's got to make Hunter look good? And it absolutely. Killed me, killed me, killed me to my core, Max, that I didn't take Michael Penix here because I've really – I would love him in Minnesota too, but I'm taking the injury history into account. I'm taking the age into account. Give me Shador Sanders to the Minnesota Vikings, throwing to Justin Jefferson and Jordan Addison love. at 23, man. I, I, I think Shador – look, Colorado, blazing hot start last year, as, as did Sanders, you know, but – it, it's not his fault that they fell apart, man. Their defense was a wreck as the year went on. Their offensive line was a wreck. I believe he was the most sacked quarterback in the country. Some of that on him trying to make plays and hold the ball too long. But I want to tell you some football IQ off the charts as it should be. Deadly accurate when he's clean. Functional mobility. All level, Can throw to all levels of the field. And their receiving core at Colorado this year is loaded. Yeah. Loaded. Loaded. Travis Hunter, Marion Miller, I believe Jimmy Horn Jr. is still there. LaJonte Wester, my guy from FAU. Yep. Look out for Dylan Edwards in the backfield if their offensive line gets better. They got Will Shepard, too, I think, right? The Vandy receiver, who's they, really good. Will Shepard from yeah. Vandy. I mean, that's how loaded they are. I'm forgetting guys. Yeah. Literally. I mean, <laughs> I, 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 I think Wester out of all those guys could have a huge year. But so Shadour is a centerpiece of all of it. Put everything around him. They've brought in a ton of transfers on the offensive line to try to fix that. It's very possible that Shadour is the best quarterback in the country this coming year because he's more mobile he's more mobile than Carson Beck that's going to be a big thing and, mm -hmm. and I think Colorado could light it up in the Big 12 but Shadour getting to Minnesota getting to run Kevin O'Connell's offense with Jefferson Addison Hawkinson whatever they fill in a tailback a good offensive line that will protect him I, I think he you could be talking about rookie of the year type stuff if that were to happen really the, even even a rookie of the year, even with all these quarterbacks that we have in this, like I, I could totally see that. I think that's totally. I, I said it, man. I, I wrote, when I wrote them up as for my top ten quarterbacks piece, I said within a clean pocket, there's nobody better in college football right now than Shador Sanders. The problem is that Colorado does not give him a clean pocket. But you've sent him to Minnesota with Christian Darrisaw and Brian O'Neill protecting him. That's that's what you need for him, and you got you give him great weapons to throw to too. And like you mentioned, Jefferson, Addison, Hawkinson. Uh, I love Shador Sanders. I think. The him and Carson Beck, those are pretty clearly to me the top two quarterbacks. I know people love Quinn Ewers. I'm not there yet to put him in that, in that tier with uh, Shador and Carson Beck. But if you're telling me, hey, a quarterback is going number one overall next year, who is it going to be? 
I'm saying either Carson Beck or Shador Sanders. I think those are the two guys that I go with right now. Now, I do think Minnesota will be one of those places that, that uh, his dad, Dion, says, okay, I I'm willing to send you there. Because there has been talk from Dion already saying, hey, there are going to be places that we're going to pull an Eli and say, hey, we're not going there. Uh, I think Minnesota, he'll say, you know what? It's in a dome. you got great weapons. you got a great coach. you got a great offensive line. That's one that he'll probably give the, uh, the okay to and say, okay, yeah, I'll let my son go play for the uh, Minnesota Vikings there at 23. All right. I got the Cowboys here at 24, and I'm going with the guy. We and I we just talked about how great Mason Graham is. This guy might push him for DT one man because of how much of a, he might be the biggest unicorn, including Travis Hunter. It, actually, no, Travis Hunter's the biggest unicorn, but right behind him is Deion Walker, the T tackle from Kentucky uh, in 2025. Just to uh, kind of tell you guys what you're getting with Deion Walker here, he is the textbook definition of first guy off the bus, six foot six. 348 pounds as a defensive tackle he is that big so you're hearing that and you're gonna say okay we're talking about like a jordan davis we're talking about a tavondry sweat type of player where you're just gonna eat up the run game not really add much as a pass rusher that's not him at all now he does play the first part really well 81.7 uh run defense grade this past year but the latter about him not adding anything as a pass rusher is could not be further from the truth, honestly, man. 51 pressures this past season, which led all defensive tackles in college football. He had eight sacks, which were tied for the most among power five D tackles. Um, he is a special, special player. Obviously, at 348 pounds, six foot six, the sheer strength to overpower offensive linemen, but he also wins with outstanding agility and finesse at that size, man, too. I actually think he could play with uh, his strength even more because it seems like he relies too much on his finesse right now, but Deion Walker is one of one, man, and I love Mason Graham, and I love his tape, and I think right now he's a better player than Deion Walker, but I could easily see Deion Walker being a better prospect just because NFL teams are going to look at him and say, this guy does not exist, literally does not exist, and they're going to say, we need to get that guy in the building because his ceiling is so ridiculous and the fact that he's already one of the best pass rushers, if not the best pass rusher in college football, in the SEC, by the way, love the nation and pressures at that size. I, I think he and he and uh, Mason Graham could both be top five picks next year. I would not bat an eye because I think those are both two special prospects that we're going to get on the interior defensive line next year. It, it's possible that in next year's class that Walker is actually the most fun player to watch yeah. because really he's he's an alien. I, I, yeah. I don't even know. Even this year, I, you watch him, especially I think it was against Louisville, their last their last or second to last game of the year, just took the game over. They, yeah. they couldn't block him. And you mentioned it, talking about SEC offensive lines that he's just bulldozing through. It's crazy what he does. That athleticism at, at that size, I, I wonder if they would change the rules just to not have a guy like that in there. But right. man, he's no, he's going to be, he's a freak of nature, man. I don't know what Kentucky as a team is going to look like, but I know what Deion Walker is going to look like. And it's <laughs> it's an absolute alien, an absolute alien. But well, look, look at all the talent. This is 17 through 24, Max. Look, at look, these are some freaks that we have yeah. this far down. I mean, these two draft classes are just unreal. And when you're, when you're finishing the back end here with guys like Travis Hunter and Deion Walker, who, <laughs> <laughs> might be for their for what they do might be the two most athletic guys in this entire draft. Uh -huh. I mean, it's it's just crazy what the next two draft classes have going. But I'm gonna I'm gonna skip now a year ahead. We're gonna get into our first 2026. Let's go here. finally. Let's go. Let's go. Green Bay Packers. Green Bay Packers at 25. Man, so they lost like almost all their safeties mm -hmm. right and free right after the season they went and got they got jeff halfley running their defense right runs a ton of single high things like that so they signed xavier mckinney to play the deep center field role well they need another one right they've mm -hmm. got xavier mckinney and they've got my guy anthony johnson absolutely love him but they still need something johnson right now still a work in progress still needs you know he's versatile but i think right now he works in more of a backup role rotational role Let's get Caleb Downs, Let's right? Go. Last Love year it. at Alabama, this year going into Ohio State, arguably the best safety in the country, can do just about anything. It doesn't matter. You want to put him deep, you want to put him deep half, quarter, slot, wherever. Caleb Downs is an absolute freak. What he did as a freshman last year, as maybe walking in, is maybe the best safety in the country, in the best secondary. He was the best player in the best secondary in the country last year. You talk about Kool-Aid, you talk about Terry on Arnold, all these – and he just walks right in as a true freshman mm -hmm. and is Alabama's arguably their best defensive player. It's crazy. And now going to Ohio State, which is the one thing they needed was premier safety play, and on a team that has national title kind of hopes, 
no, Caleb Downs, man, uh, to fit alongside Xavier McKinney in Green Bay, that would just it would just completely round out their defense. They do need a linebacker, but I wouldn't take a linebacker in this scenario at 25. Caleb Downs, just wait. He'll be the first safety off the board in 2026. I'd be shocked if he wasn't. Yeah, so would I, dude. I, he is going to be a special prospect. He's going to go down as one of the best safety prospects I think we've ever seen. And I know that's a high praise for a guy who's only played one year of college football. But um, he was like this coming out of high school, too. I mean, he actually, so yeah, he's actually the younger brother of Josh Downs, the uh, co- current Indianapolis Colts receiver. Um, and Caleb was the highest rated safety recruit since Derwin James coming out of high school. Uh, first team All American for us this past season. Like you said, man, he is a special, special player. And I can't wait to see what he does for Ohio State uh, next year in their defense. All right, so I have the next pick here, which is the Tampa Bay Buccaneers here at 26. Um, I really like them taking an edge defender in this draft. And there were a couple guys I was considering here. I was considering Jared Verse, um, who's still available in this mock draft. But I'm actually going with the 2025 guy here. And that is Nick Scourton from now Texas A&M, transferring over there from Purdue uh, this past season. Nick Scourton, man, is a fantastic pass rusher. 21.3% pass rush win rate, ninth among all edge defenders in the country. 25 run defense stops, too, which are tied for the third most in Power 5. He's a powerful powerful player six foot four 260 pounds and he has this spin move dude that he flashes a lot he loves the spin move and for good reason because it works all the time it seems like for him um i i drew think that there's a pretty clear gap between james pierce jr and everyone else in the 2025 nfl draft of the edge defender position but the next guy and i think there is a pretty clear gap between him and, and everyone else too is nick scourton i think he's the guy to know in 2025 i cannot wait to see what he does for texas a&m next year they needed some talent in the portal after losing a ton of talent to the transfer portal nick scourts and they got an absolute superstar and he's a guy to know next year as a potential top 10 top 15 pick honestly i think he's gonna be a really really good prospect and like i said he's a very very powerful player with great finesse as well and a really really productive true sophomore season at purdue um i can't wait to see what he what he does for the uh the aggies next year in 2024 yeah, no, and there's, and I think it's a deep edge group next year, but at the top of it, when you look at guys like Jack Sawyer and JT Tuimoloau and Ashton Gelati and, and Kamon Rucker, I mean, I think those guys are, they're all like really, really good and they're grinders, but Scourton, his athleticism is on like a freak level. Yeah. His ceiling, those guys might even be better all around football players right now, but Scourton's ceiling is yeah. worth this spot absolutely i think i think pierce you're right i think he's the only other guy with a higher ceiling than scourton i'm gonna go i'm gonna stay in the uh at the edge position but come back to this year's class for arizona here at 27 give me jared verse from florida state man uh, look transfer from u albany became an absolute freak at florida state former running back wicked athletic um when he uses his length and leverage He's really the best edge rusher in this year's class. He just has to be more consistent with it, right? But for Arizona, who ranked, I believe their edge group ranked dead last in grading last season, they need this in the worst way. And Jared Verse could walk in there as their premier pass rusher. Just unbelievable body, unbelievable speed to power, length, leverage. Got to get a little bit better in run defense, but you can see the flashes when he uses. It's really, I think that's just the word that keeps coming to my mind is leverage. When he uses his leverage, with his arms and he really extends instead of kind of there's certain times he tries to get in tackles chests and things like that and work around him in a phone booth he doesn't need to do that he's like the consummate power rusher who could be really really good in both phases he would be just a perfect fit here for arizona and arizona an arizona defensive line that needs they just need talent man they they need they need it all they need talent all over the place at linebacker at corner at edge but jared verse to me just feels like the right pick to to become that premier pass rusher that they need yeah i I think it's a great pick as well i think he's a guy that i i where do i have him right now i believe i have him edge two in this draft uh ahead of dallas turn even so yeah i i love that fit for the arizona cardinals who need pass rushers honestly and i think jared verse uh i think i I looked it up actually when we're doing our uh all analyst mock draft that's coming out for pff.com pretty soon and i actually have the cardinals uh in that mock draft that i think they've been outside the top 20 in edge grading in the last two seasons it's like dude they need something there um so i i think jared verse would be a great pick for them and it kind of fits that defense as well uh buffalo bills here at 28 they need a receiver obviously but i'm actually 
actually, there's a guy here on the board that I just I can't pass him up here, man. Uh, and it's Quinion Mitchell, who I think fits the defense. I know I have Cooley CB1 in this draft, but I think Quinion just fits Buffalo really well. Um, obviously, Tredavious White is gone now. They need need help in that secondary. Buffalo, I mean, for as good of a team as they are, honestly, and with, and with Josh Allen, I mean, anything's possible for them, but they have a lot of needs on that roster. And, and I think um, just penciling in a receiver no matter what might not be the best way to go about it, man. Because, like, they have so many needs on this roster. I mean, Rasul Douglas they have at corner, but they have Christian Benford as the other corner right now. Quinion Mitchell is a really, really good prospect. I would probably take him in front of the Buffalo Bills here at 28, and I think he's the guy that I would go with just to shore up that cornerback room and then maybe grab a receiver later on. And what, there's a lot more receivers I like uh, in this class. But, yeah, Quinion is the guy that I'm going with here for the Bills at uh, 28. I feel you there. I, look, they haven't taken a corner that talented since Tredavious White, and now they just cut Tredavious White, and he's with the Rams. So I, I, I think I think it makes sense. Um, they did. They kind of – Kyrie Elam hasn't given him what what he's needed to over the last couple of years to yeah. get Quinion in there as a young talent and, and, you know, pair him with Rasul Douglas, you know, a veteran guy who's still solid, but to really set a foundation on the back end of that defense. Now their secondary is really in flux, and Quinion would bring – he's immensely talented, man. I don't care if he came from Toledo or wherever. He's he's a freaking – I've told you before, I think he's the corner in this 24 class that plays the most like Sauce Gardner. He's not – he's obviously not as big and long, but he just – it something about him. Like if you told me Quinion became the best corner in football or a top three corner – Man, oh man, I, I I would believe you there. But I'm going to stay in the secondary at 29. Give me another Big Ten safety from the class of 2026. Let's and go. I'll tell you what, you want to watch safety play this coming college football season? Just watch almost any Big Ten game. You've got Caleb <laughs> Downs. You've got Hunter Waller at Wisconsin. You've got Kevin Winston at Penn State. Mm-hmm. Still have Rod Moore at Michigan. Give me the youngest. I, I don't know if he's younger than Downs, but give me one of the youngest guys of that group. Dylan Thieneman from mm-hmm. Purdue. I'll tell you what. There is not a safety in either of these two draft classes with more sideline to sideline range than Dylan Thieneman. Single high, just about every play, highest graded safety in college football, higher than Caleb Downs last year at Purdue as a freshman. All right. Just straight up as pure a free safety as it gets. And he had a big time run defense grade too. It might have been above 90. I don't remember. 90.2. He, yeah. run defense grade. And Max, I'm telling you, he gets that. He lines up some plays 25 to 30 yards off the ball. You talk about a true center fielder. I'm talking like if if he if his freshman year is any indication, there might be like Earl Thomas level here at free safety. Seriously, he's just as true a center fielder as there is in college football, right? There is not a guy like him in this year's class at all. Not even close. The closest thing would be Kalen Bullock, and he doesn't give you a whole lot in run defense. Mm-hmm. D- Dylan Thieneman's a whole nother level. If you run a heavy single high defense, or really any, I, I don't care. He's got the range to play at any spot, any defense. It does not matter at all. He's your guy, and I think the Lions at 29 have a huge need at safety still. They filled out the corner room a little bit with Carlton Davis and Amik Robertson. They're trying to figure it out at corner. They need a free safety for a team that plays a top 10 man coverage rate. If they had Thieneman on the back end, it would get a lot harder to throw on him real quick. His range, I, I just love watching him. I just love watching him. He, he's, it, it's insane. I, I don't even know how to describe it. You just have to watch it during the season, Max, because he's just got like real deal center field range that nobody in either of these two classes matches. And he's not coming out until 2026. Yeah. He, what I love about him, man. So Downs, I mentioned before, highest rate of safety recruit we've seen since Derwin James. Thieneman is the opposite. He was the number 90 safety coming out of high school. There were 89 safeties in high school rated higher than Dylan Thieneman coming out. And he was, I don't know what they missed, man, because usually those those rankings are based off athleticism. He's got the athleticism. Like, he's got elite, elite traits. And, uh, yeah, man, he had uh, six interceptions this past year, tied for second among all safeties in the nation, only allowed five catches. Six. He caught the ball more than he allowed catches. Like, it's insane uh, what he did for Purdue this past year. And you mentioned it. Uh, Tied for fifth among all safeties in the country with a 90.2 run defense grade as well. Listen, we we spoke uh, highly about Caleb Downs and how he's going to be the number one safety off the board. Uh, there's a real chance Dylan Thieneman might beat him out for it, man. I, I think that those two are going to be unbelievable uh, in the Big Ten for the next couple seasons. I cannot wait to see what they do there. But uh, I got the, the Ravens here at, uh, at 30. 
Uh, I think they use help on the offensive line. They've lost so, uh, some big-time starters there. Uh, and I think this, this fits them so well in uh, losing Morgan Moses to the Jets and you draft Talisa Fuanga, the Oregon State right tackle. Put him there at right tackle. Um, he is a better pass blocker than he gets credit for, and he's the best run blocker in this draft, uh, and he was the best run blocker in college football this past season. And for a team that has Derrick Henry and Lamar Jackson, there's not a better fit, I think, for this offense than Talisa Fuanga. So this is not possible on actual draft night, but in this all-eligible mock draft, he does fall here to the Ravens here at 30. Uh, and I think this is a home run pick for them for what they want to do in terms of running the piss out of the football. I think Talisa Fuanga is the exact type of tackle that they want uh, in that offense. So, again, not possible in reality, but in this you know fairyland uh, mock draft we got right now, Talisa Fuanga would be a home run pick for the Ravens, I think. Hey, you never know what these teams trade up for, Max. You Maybe. never know. I can these... see them doing it, man. They this is this is their uh, guy, I feel like. If if I ever saw if I ever saw Fuaga and Derrick Henry both coming at me, I think I would retire. Yeah. Uh, that's, <laughs> that's not that's not a scenario I'd want to be in, especially if I was a defensive back. Good luck. Good luck hitting either one of those guys. But I'll tell you what, 31, I think this is another one that probably won't happen. I'll leave the one percent chance on the board just in case. But 49ers, you know, they they I think they have more spots to fix than people think, right? Like offensive line, defensive tackle. I'm actually going to get him another corner, though. And, and I'm going to get him a guy who I think right now very well could be the best corner in this draft, even ahead of Quinion Mitchell. I had him ahead of Quinion in our cornerback rankings last week. Give me Cooper DeSheen from Iowa. And I just think something about this fit in this defense with this yeah. – um, simple kind of as it is it's a lot like iowa's defense where we sit and cover three or cover four and we rush four and you guys sit in your zones and sit back and find the football right that's cooper de it just is like that's his fit in that style of defense he's already done it at iowa at a master level his technique in this class i think is unmatched mm -hmm. um the ball skills uh, he showed the athleticism the other day too it was pretty ran a four four three Go watch the high school basketball highlights. There's no questions about Cooper DeGene's athleticism. He's a, he's as good an athlete as any corner in this draft. Fundamentally sound as any corner in this draft. Ball skills, can return punts. Great in run defense, spectacular. Can play in the spot. The more I watched him, I, I had to go back and watch him again. I watched him a lot during the season. I watched him a lot right after the season. You know, grading his coverage and separation and stuff. And then watching him a third time, and how quiet he is and just how fundamentally sound he is. Max, I, I saw Trent McDuffie. I really did. I, I, I think there's going to be teams who debate whether he plays outside or inside. I'm going to clear it, though. Right now, he's not a safety. Don't put him in no. safety. Don't Do not. There's zero reason. He's played three snaps at safety in his college career. Zero reason to move him to safety. You want to put him in the slot? I get it. Because he's an elite tackler. He's an elite run defender. But he's a corner. Okay, and he, he's going to be an elite corner. His fundamentals are as clean as it gets. Honestly, he gets to the NFL, you barely have to coach him. Seriously. His his technique is that. It reminds me of Trent McDuffie. He could walk in instantly, instantly, and turn any secondary into an A secondary. And I don't think – I like Chavarius Ward, but I think DeGene could turn them into an elite unit on the back end. I love that, dude. So you mentioned Trent McDuffie. That is – he obviously plays for the Kansas City Chiefs. as a team that we're going to round out this mock draft with here at 32. This is tough because I want to take a receiver here. And you and I, when we were making this mock draft, I even texted you. I was like, man, Brian Thomas Jr. is here. And if you actually – so I, I've been doing this series. If you want to check it out on pff.com where I rank the all eligible prospects at every position. I'm going to be doing a big board as well and we're put out the mock draft as well as an article. So check it out at pff.com. The receiver rankings are out already. This guy is not one of the top 10 receivers in that ranking. So you're going to say, how the hell are you taking a guy when you have literally receivers – all over that are still eligible. I think 6 through 10 are still eligible in my receiver rankings. And I'm taking a guy who's not in the top 10. I'm taking a swing here for the Chiefs because I think it fits them so well. And I'm, I know he didn't do much as a true freshman, but I think he's got the potential to be a superstar. Zachariah Branch from USC. I'm taking here to the Kansas City Chiefs. I know he's not in my top 10, and he was USC's number four receiver this past year. Wasn't even one of their top three receivers, but you see glimpses, man, of elite speed, elite acceleration, elite change of direction ability. Jalen Waddle-esque. You even said Tyreek Hill-esque. This team has been searching for the next Tyreek Hill in this offense, Zachariah Branch might be that. So I know Brian Thomas Jr. would be a very fun th vertical threat man, but Zachariah Branch, I, I, I think he's going to be a superstar in college football. I know this is pure projection right now, and I know every other pick we've had so far, we've pointed to production more than projection. 
Zachary Branch is a projection pick, man, but I think what he showed, he, he actually was our All-American return specialist this past year. Only player in the country who had a punt return touchdown and a kick return touchdown. Um, he's got to get stronger. Only 5'10", 175 right now. But that should come with more a couple more years in a weight room, in a college weight room. But, yeah, I, I just think, man, for the Chiefs, this is the kind of receiver they're looking for right now. And I think Zachary Branch, again, he, he's not one of my – top or six through ten in that ranking and then all the six through ten guys are available but i just i i wanted to throw another 2026 guy in there just to to give the people another guy to know and i think zachariah branch will be a lot of fun in that uh that chief's offense right now no oh, i'm with you i he just he does know max he's got tyreek hill feet it, there's lightning in his feet it's I, I don't think there's another player in college football with feet like him he just last year i think was even he might have even been fifth was it but you look at all those guys that are leaving usc right brendan rice taj washington uh was it mario williams transferred to two Trans- transferred out dorian uh, singer transferred out as well to utah yeah so he immediately went really from number five just because they had so many guys and and two of them going to get drafted in a couple of weeks He's their number one guy now. If, if it's me, I'm centering my offense around his, getting him the ball as many times as possible. He has Tyreek Hill feet, and his fit on the Chiefs, boy, would give a lot of people flashbacks. I'm <laughs> telling you right now, that would. You think the dynasty's over? Uh, uh-uh. get this guy in there yep. and watch what happens. You know, but no, I mean it's it's crazy the amount of talent in this top 32 max, and the amount of talent, just the the freakish amount of talent that we had to leave off. Um, I. I I'm curious what stands out to you about the guys we had to leave off because I, 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 we could probably make another 32 and we would be like, wow, holy hell, that's a lot of. We could have done a seven round mock draft and like still had like our seventh round picks. Be like, yeah, this guy's this guy's probably going second or third round in his draft. Like he's yeah, that's how good that's how good college football talent is right now. That's that's why I wanted to do this right now. So like I know we had a lot of 2024 guys in here. I know um, there's still a lot of 2025 and 2026. Hopefully enough for you guys to kind of get a glimpse into what next year and the year after look like. But that's why I wanted to use this time to. Let's not shout out any 2024 guys because everyone knows those guys. Um, I wanted to shout out a few guys. Colson Loveland, the tight end from Michigan. I know we've had a, already a lot of Michigan players already, but Colson Loveland, I think, would easily be the number two tight end. I think he's going to be a first-round pick next year in the draft. Ruben Bain Jr., the edge defender from Miami, 2026 prospect. Um, he had – I got to find the exact um, mark, but he had one of the best pass rushing grades we've ever seen by a – a true freshman in uh, in college football, and he is a guy that I'm really high on for uh, the 2026 NFL draft, as if he can be. So the only guy, so the only one in the uh, Power Five who had a higher pass rushing grade than uh, Ruben Bain is Miles Garrett as a true freshman. And the guys right behind Ruben Bain are Harold Perkins, Nick Bosa, and Dexter Lawrence. Were the only guys behind him. So Ruben Bain is in some elite company right there, man. So I think he's another guy. Uh, speaking of Harold Perkins, another. If we wanted to get a linebacker in there, I think he would have been the linebacker that we put in this mock draft. Um, yeah, Peter Woods, the D tackle from Clemson. You also had an elite year uh, to Cario Davis, the corner from Arizona, massive corner, at six foot four. He was elite this past season. He's in the transfer portal, but he's. I think he's staying at Arizona. He's still technically in the portal, but I think he's practicing with the team. He's with the team right now. I think he's staying at Arizona. Malachi Starks, another safety from Georgia next year. The running back class, we could have had eight running backs if we wanted to with how good the running backs are. Quinn Ewers, I mean, there's a lot of guys. Are there any other guys that you, uh, or any of those, any of those guys that you think uh, could have had a real case to get in the uh, top 32 of this mock? Um, oh, certainly a case. Absolutely. I think, you know, I mentioned all the Big Ten safeties, but Malachi Starks from Georgia is big time too. But I think for me, I'm digging in. I, I just, we need to get the awareness out on next year's running back class, man, because we got freaks this year it's light this year because all of the talent stayed in school man when you look at what's coming back at that position right we could sit here and list off names like crazy right you've got Quinchon Judkins Travion Henderson Jade Nott Taj Brooks Amarion Hampton Ollie Gordon the Doak Walker winner was like I I just guy with him because it's Ashton Ginty is an elite dual threat player there are so many backs next year's running back class is going to have so much hype to it and possibly first round hype. If we were doing 2025 only, there might be a couple of guys that sneak into the first round. There are so many backs. It's, it's just, you know, this year and I get the positional value thing of like, Oh, running backs, you don't take them as high and whatever this year's talent coming in at running back or or going into the 2025 draft. It's going to challenge that you're going to see backs taken in the first round again, because there are just so 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 many of them I, I i can't wait to see which ones of them you know if ali if ali gordon can repeat as a dope walker if ashton dinty can get us his 2500 total yards like he promised us 
Um, the two backs <laughs> at Ohio State, how you know how many carries do each one get? They're both elite. They could be two of the top five backs in the country. That's you know it's weird to say because of the way you know football has gone now and passing games taking over all that. But there is so much talent at running back coming back next year. I, I can't wait to see how high some of these guys shoot up the board. So I, I rank my top ten running backs in college football returning to school. So just basically to evidence uh, how good the running back talent is. Of the 15 leading rushers in the country this past season, 12 of them are returning to school. Only three of them are gone. 12 of the 15 leading rushers. And of those 12, um, there's five players in my top 10, or at least mentioned in my article, that I, that weren't among those 12, that are in my top 10 uh, around that. So uh, I had in my all eligible rankings for running back, top three were all not uh, were all next year's guys in uh, – Gordon, Judkins, Marion Hampton. I had Ashton Genty at number five. I had Jaden Ott at number seven. Uh, Travion Henderson at, at 10. Sp- and there's a lot of other. Taj Brooks come back to school as well. I like him a lot. I mean, there's, dude, the running back class. If you need a running back, might be worth waiting a year, man, because next year's running back class is. So you have you have three guys who would be RB1 in this year's class. Is that what I've heard, right? Yeah. You have Brooks at four? Yeah, Brooks at four. Okay. I, w- I was just going to ask you how many guys, how many of these guys would be. RB1 in this year's Jinty class. Jinty might be 1 2. I might take Jinty over anyone. It's close. Well, and the thing with Brooks, the thing with Brooks too is the ACL, right? So it's like how do you take into account like if you had if you had Ashton Jinty the year he just had against Jonathan Brooks off of an ACL, it's it's kind of gets hard, but I wonder how many of those guys would, would be, be at the top ahead of Brooks in this year's I class. I think th- the top three for sure, and then after that you can make a conversation. I actually, so I since that article, I actually changed my opinion. I had Trey Benson now at RB one, but I still take all three of those guys above Trey Benson. So it's stupid, man. This class is stupid good at running back, and we didn't get any in our mock draft because, of course, we would get fired as PFF analysts if we put them if we put running backs in our first round mock draft, especially in an all eligible one. Uh, that would, that would be <laughs> bad, pretty too. But uh, yeah, this is a special running back class, though. And we can't wait to get into it uh, after this year's draft's over. We'll get into we'll fully dive into 2025 and 2026 stuff uh, potentially as well. But that's what we got for what is always my favorite thing to do every year: the all eligible mock draft. So thank you guys for watching. Make sure you subscribe to the channel for more draft content more college football content we're getting back to that pretty soon as well uh but yeah that's what we got so for dalton wasman producer eli back there i'm max chadwick and we will see you guys next time